بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. It is my great pleasure to share this session with my colleague Professor Ahmed Al Rumayyan. And without wasting time, we'll start with the first speaker, Dr. Mona Al Sheikh. Dr. Mona Al Sheikh is an associate professor. of uh, neurophysiology, Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University, and presently holds the position of Vice President of Saudi Society of Medical Education. She is an uh, academic quality consultant uh, in Prince Noura University. Dr. Mona uh, is a medical doctor with PhD in physiology and master degree in health profession. Dr. Mona has published an over 100 articles in uh, recognized journals and conferences. Uh, so the floor is for you, uh, Dr. Mona. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, Bismillah. Uh, my title today is about the wicked role of the medical education department. Uh, being involved in medical education since the year 2000, uh, I was involved with a team in uh, establishing a PBL program for medicine in the Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University. And I studied my master's in health profession education. I was an active member in the medical education unit in 2005, and I chaired the medical education department for eight years. So now I can look back at this stage of my life and I can give you some points and tips from my experience. We listened this morning to a very nice talk about the journey of medical education in the kingdom. And I think I want to give some credit to our college. Um, our medical school was established in 1975. We had the first OSPI in 1980, and the first publication after Hardin. The authors of that publication was a leader in education, uh, Dr. Basil al-Sheikh, in collaboration with Prof. Ushanayer, and uh, we are not related, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, we established a, parallel, a PBL curriculum, homemade, with all, we created the cases, we created the assessment, in the year 2000, which was a success story. The graduates of that program are now leaders in the school. So back to our topic, the wicked role of medical education department. Now I borrowed this design from the famous Broadway musical just to give an impact. But unfortunately in the social media, the reaction was, why are you talking negatively about medical education department? I said, it's not negative at all. The purpose, and I hope by the end of this talk, you will uh, realize that what we are trying to do is to allow the medical education role to be smooth and detangle it from all um, the intricacies around it. Um, so, uh, right. So the first slide says, wicked does not mean evil. And uh, if you, I mean, I'm sure you are um, aware of the literature. There is a lot of literature about wicked issues. And what we mean by that is, issues that have, that are complex. I'll come to that. So the objectives of this talk, we will talk about the criteria, you can't see the lower part, the criteria of a wicked issue. What makes an issue wicked? And then um, a road map to tame a wicked issue, whether it's in education or otherwise. And then we will talk about the role of medical education departments. Do we all agree about the role or are there differences? And I will talk about challenges from my experience and from the literature. And then you will listen or you will watch a short video about global wicked issues. So wickedness is not only in medical education. It's also a global issue. So a wicked issue, if you see, these are the characteristics of a simple issue. And a wicked issue, in contrast to that, is dynamic, changing all the time. The demarcations or the borders of that wicked issue is fuzzy, is not clear. It involves many levels and many sectors. There are 
so the boundaries are shifting, they are ambiguous, there are ch changing rules and standards, there are conflicts among the rules, and this you will see very clearly in the coming uh, presentation. And always the, there's a lot of unpredictability, and most of the time it's very resistant to solve. So you can see that these issues apply to many of the things that we face when we are talking about the role of medical education. And as you know, medical education department is not a luxury or an option. It's a must for medical schools. And um, nowadays we have, as we have listened to the journey of medical education in the kingdom, we have a lot of uh, medical education departments. Actually, every medical school has either a medical education unit or a department. So what does the literature say about taming a wicked issue? What are the what is the advice that we can do? The first step is inquiry. And what we mean by that is that you have to stop judging and replace that by curiosity. We want to find out. We don't want to give judgments because judgments has put us back for so many years. We need to replace disagreement with shared exploration. So if I am chairing the medical education department and I have a conflict with the vice dean of academic, we can come together and do a shared uh, decision about what is the best way to fulfill or to um, fulfill our roles. The third way is by stopping defensiveness. It's not about defensing myself or defensing my college. It's about self-reflection. So let's do a shared self-reflection. We all share the sincerity and the, well, yeah, the, we want to benefit the school, we want to have the best outcomes in the uh, kingdom and, and, and internationally. So this shared um, uh, goal, should, we ha should have a shared self-reflection to reach that goal. And most importantly, we have to stop assumptions. Unfortunately, in many situations, assumptions have destroyed a lot of our efforts and replace that with questions. When I was doing my master's in health profession education, my instructor selected a paper of two parts called Questioning the Underlying Assumptions. And it was such a long paper and I was so furious for, because we used to present those as a journal club and there was a big competition between me and the other candidates. But now I'm so thankful because that paper changed my life. Now I know how to employ psychology into solving many of the issues that faced my life. So questioning the underlying assumptions is a big issue. So what we need, the second part of taming a wicked issue is observe for patterns. Look for thoughts, feelings. Look at the behavior and what is the thoughts and feelings behind it. Why these people and these entities are acting in this way. And if you are good enough, you can even look at the core beliefs or the underlying assumptions that led to that behavior. And if you want that behavior to stop or to change, you need actually to deal with the underlying assumptions. The third policy or strategy by which we can tame a wicked issue is called adaptive inquiry. And there are three parts. And you, I'm sure you're all familiar with this because it's used for so many the what, so what, now what. So in the what, what we are doing is looking for data. What is known? Okay, so we're just collecting data. It's like a SWOT analysis, situational analysis. But the biggest part is the so what. Okay, how does this data or this present situation influence me or the stakeholders or the quality of education in my school. And that's probably the most difficult part because I have to really look into impact of the situation and the issues that we mentioned on the environment. The last stage is now what? Now what do you want to do? You have known what is going on. You know how it's impacting your education. Now what do you want to do? So what are we going to measure in addition to what we have? What are we going to do? And this is the last part in order to solve a wicked issue. So tips in the literature about taming a wicked issue include networking. So you need to network within your college. 
network at the national level, international level. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Look at what people have done in the past to tame these wicked issues and try to use them. Observe for patterns, and I cannot stress this more. Even more, if you are an, um, if you hold a high position and you are sitting in your office and you don't know what's going on between between the stakeholders, you need to observe for patterns, or you can employ people who can do part of that. So you need to be agile, think outside the box, and you will see in the video how that was done by a simple little fish. So we need transparency. We are not here to, you know, uh, expose people. We are here to find solution for the better of everybody, for the smooth operation of everybody. So we need to, to do dynamic co-creation with solutions. And as, if I remember from the criteria of a wicked issue, that it has its resistance to solve. It is unpredictable. And this is what we are we are trying to do. This is why you need to have all the efforts collaborating together in order to reach a solution. And you need smart and wise ideas. Use the talent of young people. And use the talent of students. Empower students. Sometimes they give you the best solutions. So let's talk about the role of medical education department. What is the breadth and what is the depth? And this we have got by by reviewing the literature from seven World Health Organization region and by consulting experts. So we came up with 10 major categories under which the medical education department role falls. So the first one is faculty development. Is there a medical education department that does not do faculty development? No, and this includes so let's take one by one. The first one includes all those continuous professional development workshops, the activities, and even sometimes peer evaluation processes, faculty orientation, orienting them to the instructional strategy, to the assessment strategy, and so on. The second role is the curriculum development. Are the medical education department involved in curriculum development? Yes, most of the time they are involved in aligning the curriculum with the strategy of the college and the university, observing how the curriculum is being implemented and the curriculum on paper and curriculum in action should be the same. I, I, I say this is similar to the cerebellum, which always look at the plan of a motor activity and the actual and makes corrective actions. And periodic review of the curriculum, design new programs, if there is a new program to be done, of with a different strategy, and sometimes even ensuring educational alignment. Are the learning outcomes being taught and assessed in a way, in a proper way? Teaching and learning, the medical education department can design and even supervise implementation of the teaching and learning strategies. They can develop, so they are instructional designers. Because your medical education department includes that NIDAS of the experts in education in your school, they are always given the tasks or they can have the initiative of designing courses, instructional material that can be additive to an existing course or a blended uh, type of course and orienting the students. Orientation of the students is very important. We can teach students how to take notes in a lecture, how to adopt the best learning styles, how best to take an exam, like the licensure exam, for example. The fourth one is assessment, and I, I tell you assessment was probably the reason why many medical education departments were established. And by this, we mean publishing strategies and policies for assessment. It's the quality assurance of exam, whether it's written exams or practical exams. So they are in charge of the quality metrics, qualitative, quantitative, giving feedback, archives of exam items and OMRs, um, membership to national item banks and international item banks and supplying those item banks with proper items that have been um, item analyzed. And also establishing the item bank of the college. So it's the center where all the items are being um, uh, banked. And sometimes even score adjustment because they follow evidence. The evaluation includes internal, external consultation, curriculum mapping, 
Uh, you see that curriculum planning is occurring twice under curriculum and here. Achievement of program learning outcomes. Now, is this important? Yes, no medical school will be accredited without this uh, practice. And benchmarking the program with, nation, with itself, with national curricula, and with international curricula. So all of these roles, the medical education department is involved in. The medical education department can launch or design certificate courses, diploma, master degrees. And you have heard this morning how many master degrees we have in the kingdom at the present. And train the trainer courses. Of course, the first three are usually for faculty. The train the trainer courses is for trainees or residents. So all of these, it's like the educational hub. All the journal clubs, brown bag meetings, all of these kinds of um, education activities. How about research, education research? There is a lot of paucity of educational research in the medical schools. And I tell you, since the establishment of our educational unit in 2005, the research, uh, educational research publication has surged because they either involve you or they come and take your advice about the design of the, the, the data analysis and how they uh, publish their papers. So there was a, a marked increase in education, which is a very nice KPI that lead you to tell you how effective the medical education department is. So the members of the medical education department can participate in conferences. They can lead and support the research in the area. And they can, if, like we have seen yesterday, the launch of the medical education journal, they can be involved in publishing their own journal or even just a newsletter. Oh, did I go back? Sorry. Right, information technology. Is that an important role? Yes, and we've seen this during the pandemic. Medical education department were in charge of selecting the online platform for learning and for assessment in selecting the learning management system that's most appropriate for the curriculum, virtual reality and artificial intelligence. This is coming. This is, these are futuristic kinds of roles. Clinical simulation, the role of medical education in clinical simulation is variable. Some of the departments are totally in charge of the clinical simulation. Then the beauty of this is that the educationists are the best to design the space or the premises of the clinical simulation. So if they are involved earlier, the earlier, the better. And they can design the briefing, debriefing, so the instructional design of the clinical simulation material and quality assurance or accreditation. Whenever there's an accreditation, medical education departments write the self-study report or at least the standard about learning and teaching because they are the ones who have all the evidence related to that standard. They can also establish an internal quality system. They can uh, develop the faculty, how to write a proper learning outcome, how to write a course specification, course report, program specification or program report. All of these are possible functions or medical education departments. Why am I looking into all of these? Just to tell you how complex the function or the role of medical education department can be. Because these roles, they intersect and they conflict with many entities and parties in the medical school, like the Vice Dean of Academic, the Vice Dean of Quality, the Deanship of Academic Development, Deanship of E-Learning, Deanship of IT, Deanship of Library, Deanship of Research. All of these, they have intersection with the role that the medical education department is doing. So you can see most of the criteria for a wicked issue actually applies to the role in medical education, of medical education department. With a quick qualitative uh, review or um, study of in the East Mediterranean region of about 30 medical education department, the roles were as follows. So the biggest role was B, which is academic or faculty development program, followed by E, which was quality and accreditation, followed by A, which is assessment, followed by D, curriculum development, and followed by C, which is research. Now, assessment used to be totally under medical education departments, but I see there is a trend now of shifting that towards 
academic affairs. So there is a change. That's why it's not full as the faculty de development. So this is just a qualitative, quick look about the roles and what um, the priorities of actions of these medical. And we noticed one thing else. We noticed that the medical education departments or units, they follow the 80-20 rule. So they fulfill 80% of the institutional logic for that department by 80% of their capacity, while all the rest of the functions are only given 20% of their capacity. And what are these institutional logics? They can be, so we have seen departments who are fully just doing faculty development, departments who are mainly doing accreditation, and departments who are mainly doing assessment. So these are the three institutional logics for establishing a medical education department. And this is the paper. I just want to share with you the qualitative input of some leaders of medical education departments. In Canada, for example, he says, our unit is primarily a service unit. In other words, they just do what they are requested. So people consult them, request them to do things, and this is how they go. In USA, we are a quality improvement shop. Okay. The third comment was that we are largely responsible for the operational delivery of the program. So it depends the shift in emphasis of the role of medical education department depends on the institutional logic why they established that department. Now, in Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University, medical education department is 100% involved in assessment, 100% involved in faculty development, partially involved, there's a big role in research and development. I'm um, sorry. 70% involved in education. We have established a course called Essential Skills in Health Profession Education, which is accredited by the Saudi Commission of Health Speciality. It's a nine days course with three modules on teaching and learning, assessment, and curriculum design. And we also designed a master's program, which was given a very high rating by the international uh, evaluation, but it's not yet in action. Clinical simulation, we used to be in charge of the clinical simulating center, but this has changed lately because the head of the clinical simulation center is a separate entity that is not under medical education anymore. So this is the present situation in, in my school, in my college. Now, challenges that face medical education department from my point of view. And now, the reason I'm talking about this now is that I'm not directly involved with them. So I'm, talk, I'm talking from a distance. I'm not, uh, I'm not in, the, in the battle, if you like. And before I go into that, I will talk to you about wicked issues or challenges of medical education in general. This is a paper by Stuart Minnan in 2020 in which he lists 10 wicked issues in medical education. And you can see clearly number five. Oh, it's four. Why did it shift? No, I wanted number five, actually. So it's shifted by one. So it's number five, seven, and nine. They actually apply to the medical education role very well. And I'll show you how. So from my experience, challenges to the medical education department role is, lies first in the structure. Where should you put in the organogram of the school the medical education department? Should it be in the preclinical? And many schools, they do that. Oh, you can't see it. It's here. <laughs> Down. <laughs> Can I take this uh, chair away? Or, or you can find it in the clinical. And I find this ridiculous because now we are integrated. We have integrated programs. So we have blocks, block systems. There is nothing like pure preclinical and clinical. And medical education involves the whole program. It involves the whole curriculum. It cannot be segregated into preclinical or clinical. I have seen it also in the organogram at the level of the vice dean, reporting to the dean directly. And I think this is a better kind of representation because they have to be empowered. They have to be able to send memorandum to all, a memoranda to all the departments and they need some uh, higher governance.
Okay, so the first challenge is structure. Second challenge is resources. Do medical education department need resources? Of course. For what? For scanners, for OMRs, for softwares, for inviting speakers, for subscription to item banks. Think of it for renting venues for their courses, for catering, for incentivizing the best teacher award. So many things. And the issue is if the department tries to get its own revenues from its activities, this is also very complex. I've tried to do that through the examination center. We were doing, you know, like um, uh, examination uh, item analysis for colleges that are not within the health profession. And we got money for that through the finance. And there, it was a big problem. There are a lot of restrictions on those revenues, even if you use them just for the purpose of, and you know, for accrediting the course from the Saudi Commission. You know, they take 200 for each credit hour. And every time you repeat the course, you have to give the same amount. It's too much. And most of the time, the chair of the department finds himself he's paying from his own pocket. Even the softwares, you want to update the softwares. You need to give personalized feedback to your students automatically. So in order to keep up with what's going on uh, in the international world and in education, you need money. The richer, the more powerful. Third challenge, manpower. It's very hard to find appropriate members of the medical education department. Why? Because from my experience, there are people who have qualifi qualifications, they have masters and PhD degrees, and there are faculty who have, or members who have experience. And sometimes they don't, it's not the same. Sometimes you find that people who don't have qualifications, they might help you more with blueprinting, they have experience with curriculum mapping, they, can, they have psychometrics, and they can help you with the uh, quality metrics of the assessment, while those with degrees might not have that much of experience. So selection of the faculty is very critical. And once you find that faculty, and you are patient developing that faculty in a particular uh, role, what happens is that you are faced with the problem that of part-timer versus full-timer. So if you employ or recruit a surgeon, do you think he's going to sit in the medical education department and leave his operations and patients? No, he will be shared with the surgical or surgery department. So he'll be doing surgeries, he'll be seeing patients, and I feel, I have seen medical education departments made of part-timers. I think 30% of full-timers is a good balance to, you know, fulfill all these functions. So we need to look for full-timers, people who have no other um, reporting. They just report to the medical education chair. So most of the time you find your members are juggling so many roles. They are teaching, they are writing exams, they are supervising masters and PhD theses for other specialities. They, they are doing operations, uh, seeing the clinic, and even sometimes they are requested by a dean of some college to evaluate a program or design some instructional design. So they are like the consultants of the whole university. And this puts a lot of pressure on you as a leader on medical education department or on the department as a whole. Sometimes you have a low faculty retention and it's re really hard. You find those experts and you develop them and they develop experience so they become a rare commodity. You don't want them to go anywhere. You want them to last for long. And sometimes you are patient enough to let them go and do their PhDs while they are on the job. So what happens? These rare commodities, they have a lot of competition. There is a lot of um, uh, attraction somewhere else. And we don't blame them if they go to another place which gives them better challenge, better pay, or more ability to develop themselves. Okay. So this happens. So the turnover, the high turnover of the faculty members in the medical education department is another challenge. 
And sometimes you are in this situation. You have, you're holding to your faculty member, which you have played very hard to get and develop and get him qualified. And there is another entity or sector in the university or college that is pulling him to you know, make, make use of his expertise. So the member is under tension and this might lead them to leave or resign. And sometimes a powerful person in higher administration comes and takes one of your faculty members. It can happen. Premises. What space do you have for the medical education department? We need a big space because you need space for the examination center under digital lock. You need lockers to keep those question papers and OMR sheets. Uh, you need a confidential area for discussing and quality assurance of items. Uh, you need um, um, a conference room to present journal club and keep your faculty members aware or updated as far as medical education. So you need to have enough space. If you are given a small space, you will be struggling, you know, in uh, uh, fulfilling all these roles. So global wicked issues. So wicked issues is not just a term that applies to medical education. It is not just uh, a term that applies to the role of medical education department, but rather it applies to many global issues. And please remember, wicked does not mean evil. We are talking about complex issues that we have to collaborate together to find solutions, to tame them, and make the role of medical education department more effective, more smooth, less of a burden on all faculty. And by the way, members of the medical education department, they don't get an extra pay. They don't, they don't get supported when they apply for promotion. So all this extra work which they are doing, they are doing just because of their passion towards education. So the take home message, we need first to define the medical education role. And by that we mean, we need a consensus on what are, what is the depth and what is the breadth and depth of the role of medical education department? And we need this to do this at national and international. Secondly, we need to observe for wicked issue patterns. So preferably this will be a mixed method kind of thing. Surveys with qualitative input. You see the qualitative input in the paper I show you. It gives us a lot of insight. Thirdly, and this is most important, we need to tame those wicked issues. Together, collaborate. I cannot stress collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Communicate with educators locally, internationally, and communicate with different sectors in your university or college because this operation in silos does not make the wicked issues even worse. Lastly, we need probably to design a tool to evaluate the effectiveness of medical education departments. And probably this will evaluate the scope, the depth, and the quality. Now we will, these are my contacts, and I hope that you will watch a short video about global issues, uh, wicked issues. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Uh, I think the organizers th want to take the question. Th thank you very much, the, Dr. Mona, for this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, we know you are going to the airport soon, so we will open the floor for uh, uh, any questions to Dr. Mona before she leaves. Assalamu alaikum, Jamila Farsi, Mijamat and Malik Abdelaziz, and Kulay Tibal Asnan. Thank you very much, Dr. Amuna. That was a beautiful presentation. Um, now, mm, the medical school is the mother of all the health science other schools. And whatever task the medical de uh, educational department is taking in the medical school, the same should be applying to. Um, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, allied health sciences. Sure. But why is, uh, how can we uh, get the best utilization of any medical education department from the medical school so that it covered all other health sciences? It's, it's the same job, not much of a change. But I still see we are sitting there uh, in a bit of uh, a shy chairs the other school. I don't think duplicating that in other school is, is a benefit to anybody. So uh, how can we do that <coughs> coverage or shift or whatever? Yes. Uh, thank you for asking this question, Prof. Jamila. Actually, in our uh, university, our medical education department was covering all the six health profession colleges with exam, with the faculty development, with education, with all of these roles. Uh, so we were not separating the medical school, but now they started to have satellite medical education units, and some of them have taken over their exams, part of their uh, faculty development. So as you said, medical school is the mother, and uh, we nurture them till they grow enough to be on their own. But as you said, I think there are advantages for having a centralized medical education department, and there are disadvantages because it really overburdens the system. Especially if you have, don't have too many staff. But I, I, I think that's a very good point. We can think about why not have one centralized medical education department to serve each sector, like health profession, science colleges, engineering colleges, and so on. Each sector will have one education department. <coughs> yes, Dr. Dr. Ali Al-Ghamdi, Jamaat Al-Baha. Thank you, Dr. Ramona, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I think the, the role of medical uh, education department uh, is uh, very clearly uh, important for any leader in the academic field. Uh, the problem which we really facing that uh, most of the university, um, they just like to make it as a unit or uh, you know, because we know the importance of being a department. Yeah. If you want to assign a new uh, comer to the department to promote them, to graduate them, it has to be an academic department. Sure. And uh, maybe with the help of uh, our uh, Saudi uh, Committee for uh, Medical Education, a good recommendation from them that would reach to a higher authority that this is a very important department which should be really established in any medical college. Yeah. Uh, whatever uh, this department will uh, uh, take care of other medical uh, you know, uh, science colleges or help them or at least being established because we know if we are a surgeon and part-time in the medical <coughs> education, your interest sometime will fade away at certain point and you will not continue unless you have a real department and people who uh, are, you know, devoted 100% to this department assigned from the administrator yeah. and grow up up to professor in this department. This really will enrich the medical education and promote, you know, the colleges to a high standard level. Yeah. 
And thank you again for the totally nice agree, Dr. Ali. But yeah, the labeling of a department gives more power and more you know, scope to the role, like you know, initiating courses, giving degrees and certificates. But the label does not mean much. The issue is how much role do they do? How much they are involved in actual quality of education and teaching and learning, educational environment, measurement, assessment. So that's what really matters. But I think it's the, in the hand of the schools to change the units into departments. It does not really require any, because now most of the schools have a medical education department. They started as a unit, and now they are a department. Yes, any other question? I think uh, Dr. Omar, yes, please. Halas? I think it should be the last question, uh, Dr. Omar, and try to make it short because of... Uh, no, I have no problem. I just don't, I'm, I'm sure you are waiting for the presentation by Prof. Muhammad al -Shir. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, very important presentation. Okay. Um, uh, my question is about the role of program evaluation as a role for a medical education department rather than a quality assurance department. And, uh -huh. and, and, the, and the relation between the medical education department and the quality assurance department. Is, is there anything as a quality assurance department? I know there, there's a vice dean of quality, you mean? Vice dean of quality, right? There's a quality assurance office, which is headed by the which dean of quality. Yeah. The, the deanship of quality. Yeah. That's why we are saying it's wicked, because there are no clear demarcation. Part is done by the quality deanship, part is done by the vice dean of quality and part is done by the medical education department but if you ask me the ones who are really have the expertise and knowledge are the members of the medical education department because they have the solid knowledge the science and art of doing it quality might be so they, they have to work hand in hand this is why i said there should be shared reflection shared decision shared exploration to find the best way that, is, that, that can yani, um, serve your school in the best way. Okay, th thank hey, you. Dr. Saleh, you have a question? Can you give the microphone to Dr. Saleh, please? And we'll come back to it. Here, here. Now, get down, get down. Thank you very much, everyone. Saleh Rabesh, Kuliyat Tab, Jamaat Al Qasim. My question uh, to you, Dr. Amuna, uh, now, um, as you know, and uh, I'm sure my colleagues in uh, the government universities, now there is restructuring for the colleges and departments. Yeah. And I saw the medical education departments as achievements now. But now with Kafa'at uh, al-Infaq, they're trying to close this department. I think my colleagues here. Uh, Anybody close the medical education department here? No, there is a proposal for that, Dr. <laughs> because there is kafaat um, al and restructuring in the universities by merging some colleges and some departments. And then th I think our rules now to raise what you said, Dr. Uh, to those people, um, as we said, the insan adu ma yajhal. فلما يكون صاحب القرار لا يعرف ما هو الميديكال ادكيشن وما هو دور الميديكال ادكيشن اوف كورس ذي ويل تراي تو كلوز ات اور ميك ات از ا يونت اور سمثينج لايك ذات اي ثينك الحفاظ على المكتسبات از بروف خالد سيد ذيس مورنينج اتس فيري امبورتنت ثانك يو فور ذيس جريت كومنت اند از يو سيد سم بيبول ثينك اتس ا لكجري but it's not a luxury anymore, and not an option even. It's a mandatory part. And actually, even the NCAA, when they come and accredit the school, if they don't have a medical education department, I think this will be a negative finding. Thank okay. you, Dr. Saleh. I think it's time, Doctor. Thank you all. Dr. Muna. Thank you all. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent. Prof. Ahmed to introduce the second speaker, please. 